We're here to welcome you all to an event around the Assistant Decision Making Capacity Act and um, the key, discuss the key considerations for our staff and our managers in CHO1. Um, for those that don't know me, um, Jerry Clerkins, my name. I'm Head of Service for Quality Safety Service Improvement for um, CHO1. Um, so, why are we having this event? Um, it was essentially to create awareness around the assistant decision making, and it's a, it's a starting point of which will be a significant journey for us all to implement the Act and the requirements therein. Um, it's important for all of us, uh, it's important for CHO1 that we have um, this um, process and this Act fully implemented. Um, and we are taking measures of bringing this in over the next, I suppose, period of time. This is not going to happen overnight. Uh, it is a slow burner, and, uh, and it really is going to impact on how we do things, on our culture and uh, on our attitudes, and most of all, uh, focusing on persons' rights. Um, so... Uh, this event today is uh, very timely, following the announcement from Minister O'Gorman and Minister Rabbit on the 24th of February this year, um, um, and the Act is to commence on the 26th of April, so we we'll probably have been a significant period of time waiting on the commencement date, so now we have it. Um, and it will bring about important changes for people who require support and, um, and make decisions and for anyone interacting with them, including healthcare workers. The Act will introduce new guiding principles about interacting with a person um, who has a decision capacity challenge. The current wardenship system for adults will be abolished, um, and all current adult ward of court will be discharged from wardship within three years of the Act commencing. A tiered system of uh, decision support arrangements will be established for people who may require support making decisions. Um, it provides for legally recognised decision makers to support a person to maximise their decision making powers. Healthcare workers will be required to engage with a person's legally appointed decision supporter. They will also be required to check a national register to see if a person has a decision supporter and or to check that the decision supporter is working within the scope of the agreement. The functional assessment of capacity will now have statutory basis and should be used in place of, uh, of status-based capacity assessments for assessment of decision-making uh, capacity. There will be statutory provision uh, for the making and recognition of ad advanced care directives. And most importantly, it is important the person and their will and preferences uh, is at the centre of their healthcare treatment, even when they lack capacity to consent to treatment. I'm delighted to welcome uh, our expert panel uh, to the event today. Um, I'm very grateful for the effort um, of making, we're delighted to have them because they're operating within a very busy schedule and uh, uh, so we're very privileged to, to have our key speakers here today. Um, I hope all of you have an agenda uh, we, uh, for, for the day. Um, so um, I want to, uh, I suppose, introduce um, our first speaker, um, and it's Anya Flynn, she's the Director of the Decision Support Service, um, and I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about Anya. Um, Anya uh, graduated from Trinity College Dublin with a law degree and um, uh, done a Master's in Literature and Research. Um, she was admitted to, to as a solicitor in 1999, and from 2012 to 17 has been a senior partner, partner in a law firm uh, specialising in public interest law, including disability and inequality law. Uh, she was on the panel uh, of legal representatives for the Mental Health Commission 
and the Mental Health Criminal Law Review Board from their in inception in 2006, and also represents wards of court instructed by the general solicitor. She has written and lectured on human rights and has been uh, a member of our Human Rights Committee uh, of the Law Society since 2012. Prior to her present appointment, um, she was a member of the Law Society's Mental Health and Decision-Making Capacity Task Force. In October 2017, Anya commenced a post uh, as inaugural director of the Decision Support Service within the Mental Health Commission. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Anya Flynn. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Am I audible to the room? Yep. I was a little bit shorter than Jerry. Okay. Um, Thanks very much to the to the HSE and to CHO One for the invitation to speak today. Um, as you might be aware, um, the Decision Support Service has been doing uh, a lot of uh, collaborative work with the HSE uh, National Office for Human Rights and Equality Policy, uh, Quiva and Jacqueline's team, uh, really since since I came into post in the uh, beginning of October of 2017, uh, and that has been a relationship which I think has worked very well. It would have been very awkward if it hadn't, actually. Um, but thankfully, uh, that has been. Um, a good and productive relationship. So um, I'll talk a bit about first principles today. Uh, we have a duty in the Decision Support Service to promote awareness and understanding of the, the founding legislation, uh, but also some practical considerations, thinking in particular about the healthcare environment. Um, we have your questions and I hope that the presentation will address some of them. And I know that the, uh, the various themes uh, and how the Act relates to the health and social care environment will be further developed by other speakers. So. The Act is law. Uh, sometimes I find myself having to restate that because even though it hasn't largely been commenced and we now do have our go live date, it was enacted uh, back at the end of 2015 when the President signed the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act on the 30th of December. Uh, then, as you might be aware, there was further uh, legislative progress during last year culminating in the signing into law by the President on the 17th of December of amending legislation. Um, whilst I'll refer to that amending legislation a bit as I go along, be aware that it hasn't significantly changed a lot of what is core to the original Act so that the approach to capacity, the guiding principles and the framework for support is largely unchanged, even though that is quite a big uh, and lengthy act a lot of what it does is technical we are the responsibility largely of the uh, department of children equality disability integration and youth um, who have had responsibility for the carriage of the act um, and indeed the funding of the decision support service part eight of the act which deals with advanced health care directives rests with health it's a strange hybrid uh, so the Minister for Health uh, has responsibility for that part of the Act. Uh, and as you heard from Gerry there, the two ministers identified on uh, the 24th of February, the 26th of April as the date for commencement of everything. It's when everything finally comes to life. Uh, I'm just, I've quoted here from part of its long title. So this is an Act to provide for the reform of the law relating to persons who require or may require assistance exercising their decision-making capacity, whether immediately in the present tense or in the future. Um, and that in the future phrase refers to the fact that the Act provides also for advanced planning, making it an Act for everybody. Um, the high level number that we came up with of individuals who may have a decision making capacity difficulty who may benefit in the immediate term from the supports is as many as 200,000 adults. That's not to say that because somebody has an intellectual disability, an acquired brain injury, enduring mental illness, dementia or whatever it might be, that they immediately have to locate themselves somewhere on the new framework or that there is a definitively new way of dealing with that person. That's not the case. Um, and then because of the in the future piece, it is an act for all adults in Ireland. So these are some of the key reforms which the Act brought about. As Jerry was saying, we see the abolition of the existing wards of court system under the Lunacy Regulation Act of 1871. So that Victorian piece of legislation is the main statutory uh, vehicle for the wardship uh, system today. Post commencement, so as of the 26th of April, there will be no new applications for wardship. 
The amending legislation brought about a bit of a change, introducing a transitional arrangement, so that if an, a petition to bring somebody into wardship has been commenced before the 26th of April, then that application can run its course. So somebody might still be admitted to wardship after the 26th of April if that application had begun before the 26th of April. But the amending legislation also provides that they could move over in a parallel way to the supports under the new Act. Um, I won't dwell on it, but it's already come to life. Um, a totally antique piece of legislation, the Marriage of Lunatics Act of 1811, has already, the repeal of that has already been commenced. That was a, an ancient law which said a ward of court simply couldn't get married. Um, under part six of the Act, all current adult wards of court are coming out of wardship. There are about 2,200 or a little more of them. Uh, the biggest single category are older adults with dementia. Uh, all will be exiting wardship and that process has to be completed within three years. As of the 26th of April, any one of that number is eligible to um, go to the top of the queue if they can manage it and to ask the wardship court to review their case. Uh, that is not being managed by the Decision Support Service, that's the responsibility of the Office of the Wards of Court um, and the Wardship Judges will be hearing those applications. Uh, if anyone needs signposting, the Office of the Wards of Court is already doing good communications work, reaching out to those current wards, their families and their committees to let them know what to expect. Uh, having reviewed their cases, the Wardship Court might simply return their property and their decision-making autonomy fully to them, or they might direct, the Wardship Court might direct, that they need to move over to one of the new supports offered under this Act. Um, I will go through the next pieces in, in turn. So you've heard the functional approach to capacity will be put on a statutory footing. Uh, the, I'll dwell on the, the guiding principles which the Act introduces, that new three-tier framework for support, the tools for advanced planning, and I'll say something about uh, the decision support service and our roles and functions. So section three of the Act, when it's looking at capacity, says this, that a person's capacity shall be assessed, shall in an Act, as you know, always means must, uh, shall be assessed on the basis of ability to understand at the time that a decision is to be made, the nature and consequences of that decision in the context of available choices. So very definitely a time-specific and issue-specific approach. Gone is the idea of the unsound mind. Um, if you're familiar with wardship, you will know that that is the finding which the wardship court makes. They declare a person to be of unsound mind and incapable of managing themselves or their affairs. And very often somebody is taken into wardship, and it should be as a last resort, uh, but taken into wardship for a big purpose, if you like, because some intractable problem has been encountered uh, and they're declared a ward of court in order to manage that piece of decision making. And of course the effect is that blunt instrument consequence, so that the fact that they are declared a ward of court in relation to for example, the management of a large award of compensation or a major piece of healthcare decision making means that their decision making autonomy is taken from them in relation to unrelated and potentially even quite minor matters. Um, I always quote here the example of a ward of court whom I acted for, um, a lady with some learning difficulties, some history of mental health problems, but living quite an independent life. She was made a ward of court when she received a large award of compensation and as a result couldn't apply for her own passport, give 200 euro to her grandchild or consent to a colonoscopy. Uh, nothing to do with the purpose for which she had been brought into wardship. Um, I think if we look at this definition also, you'll see the absence of any kind of diagnostic criteria or threshold. So our Act doesn't say um, incapacity linked to an impairment in functioning of the mind or brain. Any of you who might have worked with the mental capacity legislation in England and Wales or in Scotland will be familiar with that standard where incapacity is always linked to a medical finding. Not so with this Act. There isn't any kind of diagnostic entry point. Um, and therefore, with limited exceptions because of the demedicalisation of capacity, the Act isn't actually prescriptive or exhaustive about who may assess capacity, with the exception of certain, and they are very small exceptions, particular um, capacity statements which are required for certain formal purposes under the Act, where the statement has to be supplied by a medical or other healthcare professional, uh, and I'll touch on those. So that under the Act then, a person lacks capacity if unable to do the following, thinking always about the decision. So perhaps it is the decision about managing an award of compensation of €400,000. A person lacks capacity if unable to understand the information relevant to the decision, to retain it for long enough, 
to make a voluntary choice, weigh up and use the information and communicate a decision, and that's communicate with appropriate assistance if necessary. So people may have their particular communication needs, they might need sign language, assistive technology, perhaps just the interventions of the person who knows them best and their way of communicating. Those tools to support communication should be made available and the fact that they are required is no indicator of a lack of capacity. Now, a lot of this is nothing new. I know a lot is said about the major cultural shift and how people have to come to terms with a whole new approach. The Act is putting into a statute what is already the adopted approach at common law. You know, we've two ways of making law in Ireland, so it can come from the courts or it can come from the Oireachtas. And this is already law and has been since the statement of the High Court in 2008. Um, that case that I mentioned, Fitzpatrick, which concerned a woman's capacity to refuse a blood transfusion, made its way to the High Court and there uh, the High Court set out this test or one very like it. So it's happening already. You'll already be familiar with it. You're doing it already, I've no doubt. Uh, and it is contained, for example, in the HSE National Consent Policy, in Irish Medical Council guidelines and would be familiar to you from other policy and standards documents. So it's with us already. Just some terminology. Um, relevant person is the person, uh, the person at the heart of the Act uh, and the one that we all have to keep in mind. That's the person whose capacity is or may be in question in relation to a particular matter or a person who has been found to lack capacity in relation to one or more than one matter. And at C, you see again that time-specific, issue-specific approach, recognising that it's possible for a person to be A and B simultaneously in respect of different matters. So my former client her capacity may from time to time have been in question in relation to health care or certain matters. B, she might have been definitively found to lack capacity in relation to her large award of compensation. But she wasn't a relevant person at all, it seems to me, in relation to the passport or the €200 Euro cash present um, or going abroad with her family or having a colonoscopy. Decision supporter, we use in the DSS, and I see it's been adopted elsewhere, as a kind of catch-all term to mean all of the different personalities who are able to offer support. Um, so when I say decision supporter, I mean all of the below, and I'll come to them. And these are the guiding principles. The presumption of capacity is already law as well. Again, here is an example of where the Act is putting into statute what we're doing already because it's already been set out at common law. So that an adult is presumed to have capacity to make the particular decision unless and until the contrary is shown. And that would mean shown in that functional way. So you don't get to look at, and I know that we don't, but that somebody with an intellectual disability or a mental illness and go, well, I'm putting you over here because I'm presuming incapacity. Rather, the starting point is that a person is able to decide. And indeed, as you see at the second principle, have to be supported to make their own decisions as far as possible before you get even into the business of assessing their capacity. An unwise decision doesn't mean that the person lacks capacity, uh, which is different from the unlimited right to be unwise. Rather, the Act says that wanting to do the unwise thing doesn't mean that you lack the capacity to decide to do it. And they, the next principles are very much inspired by the language of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which Ireland ratified five years ago this week. So you will see principles around the minimal interventionist approach, uh, respect for dignity, <coughs> privacy, bodily integrity, participation in decision making, facilitating and encouraging that participatory approach. Again, not new to you. Um, I've put the next one in bold, giving effect as far as practicable to a person's past and present will and preferences. Um, that's kind of a golden thread that runs throughout the Act and you'll certainly, I'm sure, have heard the phrase will and preferences. It comes up at different points in the Act and is very much uh, taking its cue from the UN Convention. At the same time, acting always good, in good faith and for the benefit of the person, but nowhere in the Act will you see best interests and best interests has been very firmly um, rejected by the Committee uh, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So the starting point isn't, well, what do I objectively think is good for you, but rather, what do you want and can that be achieved? So the sorts of decisions that can be supported are broadly divided in the Act um, into property and affairs and personal welfare. And I won't go through each of these. Um, you will see, I think, that the Act kind of captures largely um, any decisions that a person might have going on. Uh, and that people might well fall across both categories. For example, the question of selling the family home might arise in order to fund, fund long-term accommodation and care needs. So on the personal welfare side, accommodation, which includes decisions about residing in a designated centre, 
education and training, social services, healthcare, including medical and treatment decision making, and then the very broad sweeping up provision, other matters relating to the relevant person's well-being. So these are all decisions that are capable of being supported under the Act. There are certain specific exclusions spelled out in one section where the existing law on capacity and consent is unaffected. There would be things like consent to sexual relationships, decision making and round sitting on a jury, placing a child for adoption and so on. But other than that, uh, the Act is not disapplied in any setting. So these are the three tiers, which I'll come to in turn. There are eligibility criteria across all tiers of decision support, so that a person would be excluded from stepping into one of these roles if they had, for example, certain previous convictions or barring orders or safety orders applied. Um, a person, if a person, the relevant person, is in residential services, then the owner or the registered provider or an employee of that service can't step into one of these formal roles. I think the perception was that there could be you know, a conflict there. Um, and all have to apply the guiding principles, um, including that all-important respect for will and preferences. So at the lowest and least formal tier, you see the decision-making assistant. Now, people are already contacting the DSS and say, saying, I think I better become my loved one's decision-making assistant. And we have to say, well, what do they want? Because this is an appointment made by the person called here the appointer, choosing somebody whom they know and trust in that pre-existing relationship who knows them. And with them, they're going to enter into a decision-making assistance agreement, which is quite light touch, as I say. That DMA, Decision Making Assistant, has a job to gather up the information, to help explain it to the person, to help them communicate what they want to do and to help to ensure that the decision is implemented. And conceivably that could be a decision around health care. It just means that here is a clear rule for somebody to be in the room, sharing in the information, being part of the conversation, not to say that everybody needs to have a DMA in order to have their loved one in the room and sharing in the conversation. I don't think anyone would ask any of us um, if, we, if the person that we brought along to an appointment was a DMA. Um, so similarly, somebody uh, should be equipped to say, well, I want them here. But here, with the DMA, is an opportunity to, to formalise that and it might smooth the path in some circumstances. Um, no capacity assessment is required um, and whilst that is notified to the DSS, so we would be able to confirm that somebody is a decision making assistant, it isn't held on a formal register in the same way that applies across the other tiers because the appointer is still deciding, they're still making the decision. Quite a bit more involved at the middle tier, so this is more formal, and the co-decision making agreement involves a process of joint decision making. It's still though at the instigation of the person, the appointer called, um, appointer here again. Not to say that they're going to be inspired necessarily without any kind of support to look for one of these arrangements, um, but it still needs to be their, their call. Choosing somebody in that relationship of support uh, and the co-decision maker then is going to do a lot of the same things as the decision making assistant in terms of gathering up and explaining information but the relationship is such that they will then take the included decisions on a joint basis so it's only if it's in the co-decision making agreement um, that does come to us for registration there are various pieces of supporting documentation um, character references and so on and also here one of these formal capacity statements. We might have an opportunity to talk about that a little more. Um, so those are statements which can be obtained from a medical or other healthcare professional. Uh, the amendments um, achieved uh, uh, a change that you only need one such statement. So it's medical or other healthcare professional named in regulations. I suspect everybody in this room would be uh, in a category named in the regulations. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about it, Quiva, but there is um, a formal delivery of training in relation to that sort of capacity statement so look out for that um, and if a statement or pardon me a decision is included in a co-decision making agreement then it must be taken jointly thereafter and it's null and void if it isn't. Um, the co-decision maker and the uh, party disagree we're often asked what happens then uh, the co-decision maker has to acquiesce um, they unless they foresee serious harm then they are ceding to the, por the person uh, and if they can't agree and they mightn't then the decision can't be made under the co-decision making agreement it is not a right of override the co-decision maker doesn't get to be a substitute decision maker 
Uh, we supervise this arrangement. Uh, we also uh, ascertain uh, on a periodic basis that capacity is what it requires to be in order for the co-decision making agreement to work. Um, and we do have a route to court when things aren't going well. Overall, we'd be supporting supporters. They are ordinary people doing this for love. Um, so we don't see ourselves policing these arrangements overtly, and they are new, uh, so we want to be able to support the supporter, but there is um, a route to court when things aren't going as they need to. The top tier is still a route to court, so a decision-making representative might be um, appointed by the court, either as an outcome of that Part 6 review of wards process, or it could be, and this would be the new thing, an application to the circuit court by any person with a bona fide interest in the welfare of the relevant person. Could be a family member, as it often is in wardship, it might be a service provider. And you're asking the court there for a declaration about the person's capacity in relation to a particular decision or decisions. Uh, so it isn't, is this a person of unsound mind, but rather, does this person have capacity to consent to whatever it might be, or can they manage their award of compensation, or are they able to take a decision to sell the family home, or maybe a combination of those, but not, am I dealing with a person of unsound mind? The court has to apply the guiding principles, um, like any other intervener, and the court keeps its own declaration in relation to capacity under review. Um, the courts manage this. This isn't DSS business. An application to court is managed by the circuit court and the court will be publishing its forms and rules and so on. So presumably if you were to instigate an application, you would be going to wherever you go currently if you have an interaction with the court, for example, in wardship. The court might make the decision for the person, but where an ongoing relationship of support is required, they're more likely to appoint a decision-making representative. And where they do, as I say, they have to apply the guiding principles, thinking about the complexity which can sometimes arise with family relationships, any conflict of interest, and what does the person want? Whom do they want to be their DMR? Ideally, it will be somebody whom they know and trust. But where nobody is available, suitable or willing, then we have a panel of decision-making representatives, professional people that we have been recruiting to that panel, vetting, training, doing all of that uh, over the last year and more at this stage. Uh, so they are about close to 50% from a legal background, 25% would be from social work, and then there are other allied health professionals uh, and some financial services professionals who will be available across the court circuits to be nominated where no one else is available. A decision-making representation order is not for all time, it's not for all purposes, it is to be limited in time and scope. There could be more than one DMR, so if you picture yourself interacting with these new personalities, be aware that there could be more than one person, but all of that will be clear from the content of the decision-making representation order, which is sent to the DSS. We're not involved up to that point, we come in at the end of this process, which is court-led. And they take their authority from the court order, whilst they are an agent making decisions on behalf of the relevant person, they still have those guiding principle obligations to uh, give effect to will and preferences as far as possible. And they're supervised like the mid-tier, the co-decision maker. They can't make decisions about certain things. They can't be involved in life-sustaining treatment decisions. They can't stop another person seeing the person. I was in the Court of Protection in London at the start of my uh, tenure, and they seem to be very preoccupied there with keeping one family member away from mother, um, which is quite depressing, actually. But the Act specifically says that um, that's not in scope for a DMR, and they will not be in reporting to us about restraint. Uh, all of the provisions about restraint were taken out of the Act at that amending amendment stage, which I think was a good thing in an Act which is supposed to be about supporting decision making. EPAs already exist, you might know that. Um, we've had the Powers of Attorney Act since 1996, and if somebody has a 1996 attorney, that is still a good document. Whether it's been made or made and registered, it doesn't need to be revisited. Um, again, this is one of the instances where a formal capacity statement is required, both when somebody makes an EPA and when it's to come into effect. Uh, what is new is that if you make a, an EPA post the 26th of April, you're making a 2015 Act EPA and we supervise those attorneys. That doesn't happen currently. And treatment has been taken out of scope so that to provide uh, into the future for 
treatment uh, decision making. That is the Advanced Healthcare Directive and I'm sure we'll be speaking about those in more detail. The idea is that it enables a person to be treated according to their will and preferences, to provide healthcare professionals with information about treatment choices and here we see our fifth decision supporter, they can name a designated healthcare representative. And the effect of refusing treatment in your AHD is that it is the same as sitting up and refusing it in the present tense. And that can be life-sustaining treatment, provided your AHD is sufficiently explicit. You can't refuse basic care. You can't plan ahead and say, if I can't say this for myself into the future, please don't administer ordinary oral hydration or nutrition, for example. There will not be a register of advanced health care directives in the immediate term. Uh, the Minister for Health, as I said, owns this part of the Act and may as opposed to shall, make regulations to provide for a register of AHDs. So we don't have those yet. I think we will, in time, have in the DSS a register of advanced healthcare directives, but we need the regulations to be able to do so. However, bear in mind that an advanced healthcare directive does not need to be registered to be a valid document. Um, you could make one uh, in the 15 minutes before you have surgery, for example, and it might still meet the qualifications to be a valid document. I got into quite... Um, an existential conversation about that recently where I said you could make it as you're being wheeled into theatre and people began to say but what have you been given your meds first and was going oh stop look it, all I'm saying is try not to make one before you're being wheeled into theatre but it could be a valid document um, there's a distinction between requesting treatment which is not binding but authoritative um, and refusing treatment and if it's a valid and applicable AHD then that is a valid refusal of treatment um, there's a process where there's a doubt about whether it's a valid AHD, a process to be followed which could include an application to court if it gets very thorny. Um, and protections from civil and criminal liability where, for example, the healthcare professional doesn't know that you have an AHD or knows but can't get to it in time, or it's not valid but you act in a good faith belief that it is valid. There are protections in there in the Act and the existing criminal law on murder, manslaughter and assisted suicide are completely um, untouched. I'm going to go talk really fast now. Um, uh, the, um, there is an exception where people are detained under the Mental Health Act. That exception has been refined, so it would mean if you are detained under 3A, if you know the Mental Health Act, which means on risk grounds, then your AHD is not binding in terms of refusing treatment for a mental disorder. We can talk about that. It was fairly contentious and might get changed in the Mental Health Act, which is priority legislation to get attention during the current term. Okay, next of kin, what does it really mean? This should be super quick because it doesn't mean anything if you are alive. Um, but there is that widespread incorrect belief that the spouse, the family member, the uh, adult child gets to decide that they have some mystical decision-making powers, that they are already the anointed person who can supply consent or share in information. Uh, unhelpful that that is such a widespread belief and it would help if we stopped saying next of kin in respect of people who are still breathing. Um, breathing, yes, you, you have to be breathing. Um, um, so, but you can see how widespread that belief is, uh, particularly on the healthcare side, that the family member zooms in and is authorised to supply consent. Uh, but we could probably talk about that for an entire conference. The DSS, as I said, our functions are to promote awareness of uh, the Act, to provide information. Do please send people to us if you're encountering family members, potential users of the Act or anybody. We are already taking queries uh, about the Act and what it might mean and sketching out people's options for them. We don't provide legal advice. We don't go beyond information and guidance. Um, and we will have those registers, which we might talk about, of the middle tier, the top tier and attorneys um, and that will be accessible by anybody with a legitimate interest or members of bodies and classes of um, classes of professionals who will have a route in to search that register. Can I say there won't be anything on it on the 26th of April? So don't worry, that, oh my goodness, I've presented with somebody and they're holding themselves out to be a thing. They literally can't be a thing under the new Act of the 26th of April because there is a certain lead time uh, for the registering of these arrangements. Uh, it's built into the Act. There are notice requirements. You can't just land a co-decision making agreement on the 26th of April because there's a process to be followed. And we're working with the HSE as we see um, HSE um, colleagues being one of the principal consumers of the Act, so we want to streamline that process. 
Uh, we have a complaints investigations function. We are not taking complaints about anybody other than decision supporters or in the context of decision support arrangements. We don't take complaints. We have no regulatory function or remit uh, beyond the Act itself. So we're not coming after healthcare professionals. Um, we will have that panel of DMRs um, available to be appointed by the court and there will also be special visitors, general visitors, who will help with our supervisory and investigative functions, some of them from a health and social care background. Um, we're the central authority um, for the Hague Convention, the International Protection of Adults. Again, I'm not expecting um, a big rush of business there because that's not a very widely adopted international instrument. It's not um, ratified anywhere in the UK, for example. But it would apply when there's a cross-border aspect to somebody's affairs. I'm unconcerned about that just yet. Um, and uh, we have to keep everything under review, reporting back to the ministers. The feedback will be very welcome to make sure everything is fit for purpose. So on the complaints investigation side, um, we have a broad remit to take up evidence, to look into things when we get a complaint about a decision support arrangement. And it could be that it's somebody in health and social care who is first alerted to this saying, well, here's a co-decision maker who is acting outside of scope, who's trying to decide for rather than with, or who appears to become unsuitable because I'm a bit worried about their own abilities. Maybe they've entered into um, being disqualified or ineligible themselves to be a co-decision maker, or it might be very dark and bad and there seems to be something that's going really quite badly wrong. That would all be for escalation to us. We will endeavour to resolve informally, but there is a route to court, including on an interim basis where the person needs to be stopped while we look at it. So we don't make decisions for people. We can't directly find a decision supporter for somebody. We won't happily have a function to manage money or property that got changed with the amending legislation. We don't provide legal advice. Uh, we don't regulate other professionals or services. And similarly, we don't have direct responsibility for the delivery of training, which is related to the fact that we're not the regulator, but have been very happy to contribute to training across many sectors. Um, and the codes of practice, I know there's a great appetite for them. You should be seeing those, ooh, fingers crossed, this month. Um, they came to us in really good shape, having been drafted um, on the healthcare side by a ministerially appointed working group led on by the HSC. Uh, there's a guidance for healthcare professionals, a particular one, a particular chapter within that relating to advanced healthcare directives, a general guidance code on supporting decision making and assessing capacity. So they are fixed at this stage. They have been uh, finished for some time, but they have to go through ministerial approval and there's a bit of choreography around whether we can put them out before the Act has commenced and whether we can put them out before the amending legislation has commenced. Anyway, I've, I've left all of that with the departments to wrangle over, but we hope to get them out there. We know there's an appetite for them. Breaching a code of practice is not civil or doesn't give rise to civil or criminal liability, but they are. Um, it's a code which is admissible in the context of other proceedings, and a person concerned shall have regard to one when carrying out a function under the Act. So, as I say, they'll be published with links to a whole wealth of other guidance documents and associated vignettes. I know everyone loves a vignette, so there will be a suite of those showing how the codes might be made work in practice. And I'm nearly done. So considerations for healthcare professionals in preparation for commencement. It's not really for me to tell you. I imagine that on the ground as professionals engaging with this in your daily life, you'll have a sense of where it's going to impact. Please, if you're getting queries about what the Act even says or does or what it might mean in an ordinary person's life, do send them to us. We have materials up on our website already, which has been established for two and a half years at this stage, a bit longer. Um, and we're adding to that all the time with frequently asked questions, other guidance materials, explainer videos. So there's a lot there um, and we do try and kind of bottom line things a bit. But the Act is big, does a lot um, and it's putting in place legal instruments in some cases. So it, people do need to be across the detail, but we also try and keep the messaging um, simple and accessible um, as far as possible. So I think in your future lives, you might anticipate engaging with a decision supporter, wanting to know their remit, both under the Act, under the guiding principles, and also, well, how do I know that in the context of a specific decision-making representation order, or co-decision-making agreement, or EPA, whatever it might be, that you are authorised to play the role which you are now playing, and that will, um, we'll be able to help with access to the register and making available um, a copy of the, the actual instruments so you can satisfy yourselves of that. 
how often you check the register, what your protocols are around that. Definitely not for the decision support service to say. I said the same thing to the Banking and Payments Federation on Monday. We can't tell you how to behave as a banker, as a healthcare professional, as a legal practitioner. We can tell you what is available. We can be on hand to provide information. Um, the Nursing Home Support Scheme has been amended in relation to care representatives. I suspect we might pick up that in discussion. Um, and um, we will also perhaps revert to those formal capacity statements required at two parts of the Act. And I've said already that it might be that you're the ones on the front line saying, well, here's a decision support arrangement gone wrong and the path is to us, to the decision support service. So look, there are a wealth of materials there. I must compliment um, HSE colleagues on all of the absolute stalwart work that has been done uh, by um, the Quiva's team and um, their allies such as uh, Sean O'Keefe who joins us today to try and socialise is the verb isn't it the act but also to provide reassurance um, I find myself um, in, now that the commencement date has been named shouting don't panic at people quite a lot but I do think that is true and fair it's a good thing it's something to be embraced it's an act which comes in peace um, and whilst there might be bumps in the road while everybody gets used to it we have to get out of 1871 and I think the future is bright so thank you very much for your attention So the answer to my question, why are we having this event? So uh, well answered. Um, it was interesting. Just uh, I think one of the your reference to the next of kin piece, which is so well embedded. Ripple around the room. <laughs> <laughs> and we still have it in our documentation, and you know we're still documenting it. Um, remember back in previously in my career, an elderly lady who was encouraged by her surgeon to have a colonoscopy. And the lady refused, and the son was invited in to sign the consent form. The lady was sedated and had her colonoscopy. Assault. So, um, you know, culturally we have to we have to uh, take that on board. Anya, thank you very much. You really set the scene for for this morning. So, thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce you to our uh, next speaker, um, and and uh, the topic is um, what will this the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act mean for practice, um, presented by um, Professor Sean O'Keefe. Welcome, Sean, uh, today. Um, Sean is a consultant geriatrician uh, and physician in our university hospital in Galway. He graduated from University College in Dublin and St. Vincent's Hospital, Dublin. He trained in internal and uh, geriatric medicine in Galway, Dublin, Boston and Liverpool. Um, he was a consultant physician in St. Michael's and St. Vincent's Hospitals in Dublin before becoming a consultant geriatrician in Galway University Hospital in 2000 and subsequently an honorary personal professor of medicine at NUI Galway. He is a member of the HSC and Ministerial Working Groups on Implementing Decision Making Capacity Act including Advanced Care Directives. He is co-chair of the HSC National Consent Policy Group. Research interests include cognitive impairment, sleep disturbance and ethical issues in the care of older people. Sean, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jerry. It's, it's good to be here. It's good to be here in person. Uh, thanks, Jacqueline. You, you see, I... I I co-chair everything. I'm not allowed to chair on my own, quite rightly. I do it with Mary Donnelly, uh, friend and colleague, press of law, of law in Cork. Just first of all, all you said, we've been interacting very smoothly at all levels. The point is that there is the law, and then there's Anya and the DSS. The codes of practice have legal force. And there will also be HSE guidance, which will be read by the courts as well if it comes to it, to kind of supplement and answer any questions you have. So, so it's a lot of material is being developed. And we're, we're aware, we've been dealing with healthcare professionals and getting a lot of feedback, which we have fed back, and a very smooth working relationship with Ronnie and Co. But we're aware of the anxieties on the ground. And Jerry said he hoped everybody had, had a, an agenda. I have an agenda, and it's like Ronnie, don't panic, calm down a bit with regard to this. 
I'm going to park one issue because it keeps cropping up. Deprivation of liberty, one of the big sources of wardship applications. It's not dealt with in this act. There's not going to be solved by it. Wardship will cease and it will revert to inherent jurisdiction of the High Court. So it's going to look very similar to how the current system is. And the good news is there is a, an expert advisory group. The department is active, which it hasn't been for some period in trying to solve this. It will need separate legislation which we hope will talk to ADM. But for the moment, could we leave that topic because it's not for today. The other one is just to recalibrate. You see all these complicated supports. And remember, the most important bit of this Act is that the guiding principles uh, now have a legislative basis. And that's enormously important for a very large number of people uh, that, that we provide services to. It's not that new. Basically, the, the language may have changed, the nuance may have changed, particularly with regard to will and preference coming, coming centrefold, but those principles have been there as the basis of good practice for years in terms of the consent policy and other, and other guidance. So it mustn't say this is all entirely new to us. No, it isn't. It shouldn't be at all. Even advanced healthcare directives, so to be important for some people, uh, but again, it's not new in that professional guidance, certainly the Medical Council, says we must respect advanced healthcare directives, and that's been there for the bones of 15 years in Medical Council guidance. And finally, <coughs> the rest in terms of the supports, they're new. They're not that important for many. Now, I appreciate this is a very high-level group, so it will be for many in this room. But in terms of the overall service, the main thing people need to know is that they will encounter the supporters that Anya has discussed and the need to respect their, their scope of decision-making when it's present. But not everybody in the service needs to suddenly go off and start learning about CDMAs in, in detail. That's not necessary. What we're hearing, and it's been consistent, is we need to identify everyone who lacks capacity. Uh, we need to perform capacity assessments quickly. There's going to be a frenzy of capacity assessments once this comes into being. We all need special training. The workload is going to be massive. We need more staff. The issue about going to court every time somebody who may lack capacity doesn't have a supporter and needs, say, an operation. And then worries about people who are members of the so-called prescribed classes and what they do. And there is no question but that the formal capacity assessment, and, and that's capacity assessment, is arduous, and so it should be. It's an important assessment. It involves work. It involves a lot of preparation, a lot of paperwork being prepared, getting the consent of the person, performing it, making sure you perform it at the right time and place and with the supports they need. So it's nothing trivial. It is hard work. The point is, though, steady on, everyone. That a lot of these are, are way overblown. If you look at it this way, it's all new. As I've said, it, it's not really. It's been there in previous HSE guidance, just the language and people learning to use language like will and preference instead of wishes and things like best interests. Uh, it's not required that we go around doing capacity assessments on everybody. It's, it's not required that we use all of the tiers of support they're problem-solving tools, and they're not mandatory interventions so that you must put somebody on the framework. And it all starts on the 26th of April, where in a panic, everybody must rush around doing this. That's absolutely counter to the Act. You think support, you think assistance, and you think of the guiding principles. There's no intervention unless necessary. So it's not if we find the capacity, we must do something. Why? If you have a current arrangement that's working well for a person and their family, for example, then why would you want to change that? There's no reason to do it just for the sake of it. I think the analogy I'd use, and Anya was right, that warship is a very blunt instrument. But think of it as a blunt instrument. All you have is a hammer and nail. It's, it's warship. And now it's going to be replaced, and instead you've got a present of a number of uh, precision instruments or tools that you can use when required. So you read the instruction leaflet and you put them carefully away in a dry place and you take them out when necessary. What you don't do is take them out and start drilling holes in the walls and furniture just because you can. That's absolutely the wrong way to look at it. So at the moment, you don't normally obsess about wardship for a lot of people under your services. And similarly, there's no need to immediately start obsessing about DMROs and co-decision makers look at where that's going to solve a problem for the person and see is there another way of doing it 
that is, is less intrusive. The prescribed classes are, are these groups, and they are important in the code decision making agreements and enduring powers of attorney where they can do the reports, the capacity reports, instead of doctors, which is fine. There is an expert group, so that's being worked through at the HSE at the moment, and this is a, a personal prediction because it hasn't reported, it's still working through, is that the, the HSE is going to facilitate staff uh, for, for those in receipt of its services uh, to assess capacity, as in the Act. But individual practitioners aren't going to be obliged to perform it. So it's people who have an interest in learning how to do this with the training tools and who want to do it and it's useful for the service in a given way uh, can learn this new skill for when required. There will be special training as Anya said and we're in the, the course of trying to develop that. Uh, two things to say, one is the during power of attorney. Think about how they're done at the moment. Uh, I say very few of you have to deal too much with creating them in, say, residential services. They're made in the community generally, and they're often made in the community by people who are not relevant people. So you can make them on your 18th birthday as a kind of a forward insurance, for example. And they're often the first point of contact after learning they exist is to a solicitor, to a legal representative. And they have, in the past, been writing mainly to people's general practitioner. And I suspect that's unlikely to change. It may do with time. But it, a lot of them, as I say, will occur in an unhurried manner in the community. The co-decision-making agreement, I think, is a key provision. And there are some complexities, but the importance, and why I think it may be very valuable for a lot of people, is that it extends autonomy for those who may have some or partial capacity. And as such, it's one that we need to use and use properly. This issue about going to court and when people hear about the DMRs and the circuit court, well, am I going to spend all my time in court and Sligo Community Services will be vying uh, to beat all other regions for most court applications of the year as a key performance indicator. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all wrong. First of all, this is the policy at the moment, and all you mentioned next of kin, which has been a troublesome phrase always. This has always been the legal position, that nobody can consent on behalf of an adult. And there's a misconception out there that ADM has somehow abolished next of kin. It, it was never a thing to begin with. Uh, and prior to it, the way of proceeding was on best interest, was the language used at the time. But again, after consulting the person and consulting those close to them, I get the feeling that the knowledge that next of kin wasn't the thing has led to a kind of a frenzy of doing assessments and, and worrying about going to court, which is unnecessary. The other one which has been damaging is saying that next of kin can't consent formally, is saying uh, that everything is anti-family, including ADM. The point is, there was never anything wrong. It was entirely right that people consulted with those close to the person. So if you're somebody in hospital and you've a worried family coming around looking for information, of course you give it to them. They know the person better anyway. They know what the person would want. They know what the person is like. They have a personal interest. So they absolutely should never be excluded. And the vast majority of cases, it's clear that the person wants you to keep them informed and to consult them, indeed, if they can't speak for themselves. It's simply not getting that mixed up with legally authorised decision maker. And similarly, of picking one member of the family, the eldest, the person going to inherit the farm as the next of kin. And that was always completely crazy and just led to problems. So this is not anti-talking to families. And families continue to have an important role and are mentioned as people whose views must be taken into account. So post-ADM, do we all have to go to court with these? Our view certainly is that we use the, the general principles in the vast majority of cases. If an operation, if an intervention, if a treatment is consistent with what the person wants, if it's for the benefit of the person and after considering the views close to the person, well then there's no need to go to the circuit court and start looking for representation orders if there isn't a problem to be solved and treatment can generally proceed in many cases. There's nothing in the Act and there'll be nothing in the codes to stop you all heading off to court every two minutes. So that's a matter of how we implement it. And we can do it well or we can do it badly or we can do it excessively or we can do it too little. 
And certainly one of our concerns, and we all have concerns, is, is the risk that a risk aversion or misunderstanding will lead to unnecessary capacity assessments, will need to request for legal advice and recourse to the courts, and that Letterkenny will do one thing and go crazy in court applications and Tralee will ignore the Act altogether, which would be equally wrong. So it's a matter of, of trying to prevent this from happening. I'm going to go back to COVID vaccine where we faced a lot of these problems in terms of people who didn't have capacity and who was consenting and what if the family said no. And we realised early that we needed to be giving advice to people on the ground, again, to stop everybody hearing off in different directions. And the COVID vaccine consent group operated extremely well. I was a member, but chaired by my Siobhan Ivrian, the National Lead for Integrated Care. And it was a clearing house for some of the queries coming in from the service and reiterating good practice guidance and making sure it was the same throughout the country as a single source, it fielded hundreds of inquiries and next to no capacity assessments or next to, next to no legal advice being sought. Because the basic principle is if the person, even if their capacity may be in question, if they're willing to receive the vaccine, give it. If they're not willing to receive the vaccine, don't give it. And don't get tied down about capacity in that particular case. We weren't going to forcibly vaccinate people on the basis that they lack capacity. So it's a similar principle as to how we're hoping to add to the advice that will be available from the DSS. So there is a HSE ADM transitional oversight group. It's in, in the moment of developing terms of reference and membership. But the same idea of trying to have a unified approach and trying to direct it that way in terms of how the service uh, acts in accordance with the role of the legislation. And indeed, there will be court cases, there will be more advice coming in time and trying to keep track of that. So it, it's very much to remember the 26th of April is not going to be a big bang. As Anya said, on the 27th of April, there's going to be no supporters. They're going to come into existence over time. So you're not going to be faced with a whole bunch of co-decision making agreements on that date. Uh, even advanced healthcare directives will call gradually into existence, so we will have time to get used to it, but always remembering that it's the general principles apply even when there are supporters, but they apply and will usually solve most problems. About advanced healthcare directives, I don't want to repeat what Anya said, except that you can refuse treatment even if it's unwise, not on sound principles, and may result in death, but you need to be explicit if you're refusing life-sustaining treatment. We're coming up with questions around, and some of you may encounter them. Does there have to be medical or legal input in, in making it? No, this is very much the choice of the person themselves who wants to create a directive. We will be recommending to people, you'll often write a better one that's more likely to be easily understood and applied if you do seek advice, say, from your journal practitioner or somebody else. They don't have to be reviewed, but we'll be recommending that people do review it as life circumstances change. Will it be a standard form? Well, yes, but it won't be a single mandatory form, so there may still be different ways of documenting it. Anya's mentioned about the register. There certainly isn't going to be one when, it's, when it uh, commences, but there may well be one eventually. What if I disagree with a refusal of treatment? To be clear that failure to comply with a valid and applicable AHD does give rise to liability. You don't get to override somebody's valid refusal, valid and applicable refusal, simply because you don't like it, and that's not an out for staff. If you don't know there is one, if you don't know it, you can't be held to account for not being able to read it and being able to apply it. Uh, certainly verbal reports are insufficient, but they may still be useful in terms of telling you the person's will and preference. If the HD is unclear, well then that's where the designated healthcare representative is very useful. Uh, if in doubt, though, despite that and despite uh, a second opinion from a colleague, go ahead and provide treatment. You know, it's, it's uh, often a common sense approach. The other one which somewhat surprised me as an issue is people saying, well, well Sligo University Hospital has a, a CPR policy so that in order for this to apply in Sligo, the AHD must be kind of rewritten in terms of the Sligo policy. Remember, the, the AHD is a legally valid refusal of treatment. It's the boss. It's the CPR policies need to bow to it and adapt and change. So nothing wrong with having policies for how things are documented, but the AHD takes primacy. And then the last is almost the most important. Does that mean all advanced care 
planning decisions need to occur in the form of advanced healthcare directives and that simply is not the case. So advanced care planning is a little bit woollier in the extent it's the refusal isn't legally binding, it may be drawn up during your current illness, uh, it can reflect your, your, your goals and preferences and beliefs uh, and it can be used to document discussions and document your prior wishes. So it's not a document, that can be only a document as such that can be drawn up only by the person themselves, but it is often very helpful in current care. So some people will prefer the somewhat woolier way of having a chat with their doctor, which is then reflected in the medical notes and the indecisions. Others, and there may be cases, particularly when we transfer care across sectors, where it would be very valuable to have it in the form of a directive. But it's not a one-size-fits-all, and advanced care planning and advanced healthcare directives are complementary. In the end, support people to make their own decisions. It is the ADM with Capacity in Brackets Act and not the other way around. So the emphasis is on assistance and support and not on identifying incapacity. The presumption of capacity, somebody said, is the same to consent as the presumption of innocence is in criminal law. It's enormously important and you don't get to overthrow it just because of a, a label like dementia or mental illness. People don't have to prove their capacity. It's the person challenging capacity who may have to prove it. Uh, it's the other way around. And please don't go looking through capacity assessments unless there's a good reason to do so and you know what you're going to be doing with the result. It is formal and arduous. There should be a trigger, there should be a reason for doing it, and you should be identifying the intervention that would be helpful and proportionate in the circumstances. And again, the three tiers, enormously valuable to have a more nuanced package of interventions, but they are to help people. They're not mandatory interventions for you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. A very practical uh, and indeed um, been able to apply this legislation. So um, thanks again. Um, just an interesting point you raised around sort of, you know, the communication. Sometimes we can use this as a barrier of not communicating. And, you know, it's in the context of the next of kin. Uh, it's important to have good communication with families and families understand. So um, again, thanks, Sean, for, for that. Um, we're just going to move on swiftly to our next speaker, uh, Quiva Gleeson. Uh, Quiva is the HSC um, National Office for Human Rights and Equality Policy. Um, and Quiva is going to talk about um, national resources and supports for managers and staff. Um, I'm sure you all know Quiva, um, or have certainly heard of Quiva. Um, I know Quiva for a number of years now, and uh, we're delighted to have her in the position that she's in in terms of driving this. And thank you so much for supporting us today and bringing today together. So for you and your team, so thank you. Um, Quiva is a general manager uh, for the National Office for Human Rights and Equality Policy uh, at the HSC. Um, Quiva is the HSC representative on the Interdepartmental Steering Board for the commencement of the Assistant Decision Capacity Act. Um, Kiva uh, has responsibility for the oversight of HSC um, national consent policy and oversight of the implementation of the System Decision Making Act in the HSC and works to progress equality, human rights, advocacy and policy issues for people with disabilities and other diverse groups in Ireland. Kiva Gleeson, thank you very much. Super. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Jerry. And I know some people, um, uh, because I live in, uh, I live in Donegal, but I had lived in, I did live in Sligo, I did live in Leitrim, I did live in, live, 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 I did live in, live in West Cavan as well. So I know this area pretty well. Originally from Galway, of course. <coughs> um, always Galway. Um, uh, so just to say before we start, I'm, I'm, um, it's great to be in a room with people. We have done online ad nauseum for a long time. We have talked to thousands of people and there's nothing like being able to have a cup of tea with people and be able to really find out what the issues are from people. Also, like, I mean, my, myself, I know myself and Sean have worked together for a very long time, but we haven't been in a room 
I'd say since the start of COVID. So it's it's a real um, privilege to be able to be in a room with people that you've worked with for quite a long time. Um, the role of our office, our office is a national office. Um, I, I manage it and then my colleague Jacqueline, who's here, who will be speaking as well. There's this very small team of us. Um, our job mainly is to, to manage the... Um, the transition from Warship into this new system, uh, no small task. We've been managing it for many years. We didn't think it was ever going to commence, but anyway, we're delighted now to finally have a date. Um, uh, and we also ha manage other human rights legislation, the Disability Act and other parts to the Act um, and um, the National Consent Policy, because the National Consent Policy and the ADM Act are intertwined. Sean has talked about this and we'll talk about this in some of the questions. If you are on top of the National Consent Policy, the segue into this Act will not be difficult. So, you know, if that's one takeaway you go away with, get familiar with that policy and what it means for, for people that you work with, that you serve. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, the resources that we've developed. Um, a lot of feedback that we're getting from people is there's just so much information. I'm sure you're probably a little bit overloaded this morning even, like there's so much information. We don't even know where to start in terms of finding stuff. So what I'm going to do is step it out for you in terms of what's there, what you need to know, how, who you need to get, get it to. You're obviously, you're all in like a really important position to be able to disseminate. So to, to bring that back to the people that you work with as well. Um, the other thing I just want to say before I start, just to say, just to acknowledge our colleagues from uh, the National Advocacy Service. I know there's a couple of people here um, and also our colleagues from Sage Advocacy. We do a lot of work and also Mental Health Reform, who our colleague is on her way. She got stuck in snow, so she's she's on her way down. We do all of our work. Um, we work in collaboration with clinicians, with frontline practitioners, with all of the advocacy organisations and, and with people who are affected by this. So all of the resources I'm going to talk about have been co-designed. Designed. Um, that takes way longer, but I think the effect, the, the kind of net effect of that is a better product. Um, uh, so so uh, the first place I'd um, recommend you all be really familiar with is our website, which is assisteddecisionmaking.ie. It's really simple. I know it's a long word, um, and whoever in their genius came up with that, it's very hard to actually to pronounce it. Any SLTs here will know, try and teach a child to do assisted decision making. It's quite difficult. That has, we try and have as much information on that all the time and um, we link with, with whatever the DSS have the decision support service have we link it back to ours as well so that we try and keep it as up to date as possible we have an explainer video um, which is the stories of people who are talking about why it matters to them and um, the decision support service are going to have another version of this a national version of this which will go on television quite soon it's brilliant uh, again the stories of people of why it matters and and the multiplicity of context so it's not just you know I think one you talked about at the beginning could be acquired brain injury dementia and um, disability the spectrum of disability it's very very varied and all of us will be affected or are affected by this in some shape or form you know and this is what this video does is it grounds it and says it's you know it I was on my bike boom that's it acquired brain injury and it just happened just like that um, so uh, we have a presentation on the act. You can take it, use it. Um, you can take the information, use it, make it your own. Um, and one of the things I want to say, and I will kind of reiterate this over and over, you do not have to rewrite this information. It's very technical. We have spent months trying to make it into easy read, accessible. If you tweak it, you may get the, the meaning of it wrong. So I'd, I'd really caution people to be very careful about trying to rewrite it into your own policy. You do not have to do that. We've done that for you. I know people like to make it their own. Be very careful. Check it with us to make sure, like the difference between a must and a may, should and a shall, that completely changes the context. So just be very careful about that. Um, we have frequently asked questions and um, we change them on a weekly basis. We also kind of marry them with whatever is happening over with the, DS, the decision support service. If there is anything that we haven't dealt with on those frequently asked questions, email us. And we have like and one of the things that we've started to realize is that people are very intimidated by this. They don't want to ask questions because they don't sound like they're stupid. There are no stupid questions with this. It's quite technical. And, you know, if you don't know it, a hundred people don't know it. So it's really important just to, you know, kind of let us know what, what's not clear. Um, we've been, as I said, we've 
we're webinared out of it, but the webinars have been very effective way to get to like we've you know like we're very disappointed on, if we don't have fifteen hundred people on our webinars, which is quite spectacular, really. Um, uh, so this is a small gig for us, really. Um, but uh, but I suppose what you don't have in in a webinar is you don't see people, you don't get to feel you know how's this going down, or you don't get to hear the stuff at the tea and coffee break, you know, in terms of well that's not really working for us. Um, these webinars that we did last year, there was five of them um, uh, all of them are still relevant and I what I would suggest is that you know you take a bit of time with your staff groups and you focus on one of them They're, the information that we did on them is still relevant all of the things that we did in each of them was we stepped out case studies we you know so we had case studies from staff whose staff submitted them to us and then we had a panel all of our panels always has a clinician always has an advocate or a person affected by the act and always has um, uh, either a legal practitioner or somebody who has specialist knowledge like somebody from the DSS or somebody from the Office of the Wards of Court. So this is really helpful information still. Um, we also have a, had a webinar just actually we recorded it in Bala Buffet at um, um, your gig in, in Bala Buffet um, and uh, on the self-advocacy event. Um, uh, and this was on, oh no, not that, that one, actually, that's another one. Um, sorry. Yeah, so this one, for anybody who's in the mental health services, it was on the interface between the Mental Health Act and the ADM Act. Very relevant. Professor Brendan Kelly, who we do a lot of work with, and others um, were on this. So, like, I'd suggest if your staff teams are from the mental health services, watch this one in the first instance. It's very accessible. Uh, the second one was um, the Warship Transition. That's the one that we recorded in Bella Buffet. Um, uh, that steps out, you know, it's quite technical as well, but if you do have engagement with wardship, you do have wards in your service or you, you know, you're involved in wardship, watch that. It's very important just to try and get an understanding. You might have to have a few goes because it is, it is quite um, heavy. Um, we have just, um, is this the one? No, not yet. Yeah, the next one. Thanks, Jacqueline. Um, yeah, so um, uh, there's an e-learning program on supporting decision making. So there's three elements to it, supporting decision making, planning for the future, which deals with some of the stuff that Sean was talking about, um, and the functional assessment of capacity. People are obsessed with the functional assessment of capacity. Watch the webinar, watch the e-learning program. If after doing that, there's gaps in your knowledge, come back to us and then we can, we can you know, we can try and work through that. But if you haven't done that, do not go and buy training from outside the HSE because they do not have the same level of knowledge that we have. And I can say that, I'll stand up in any court and say that we have been working on this ourselves. All of the people here have, are the closest to the act for anybody else in this country because we've drafted it. So I would suggest you waste money by bringing in organizations, lawyers or whoever, who, do, who are not familiar with this. It's not a good use of money at this point. Maybe further down the line, that might be the case, but not now. Part of political progress finished. So, um, uh, a new, so, so launch, news flash, this has just been launched. This is its official um, a voyage. Um, so this is the e-learning program on the act. Uh, there's three elements to it, um, one on the guiding principles, one on um, working with the decision supporters and one on advanced health care directors. It was just launched on um, Wednesday. Um, again, it's available on HSC land. Um, please give us feedback. Let us know, you know how you think about it. Um, if there's any gaps, please let us know. I, I know HSC land can be a little bit glitchy at the moment, but I think they're working through some of that stuff. Um, it's easier for us to track to see how many people have done it. Um, and I'd, I'd get that out to as many people as possible. So if all of you got that out today, I think that would be um, really important from our perspective. Um, we put together and we had just before COVID, we had a conference um, because we were really concerned the act wasn't going to commence. So part of the role of our office was to keep up pressure to say this matters. The, the wardship is not a good system for people. Yes, it's important. People do need protection, but not with a sledgehammer and a nut you know, or a sledgehammer and a nail, you know. So, so what we did was we had, a, we had a number of events at the end of 2019, um, uh, one in Dublin, two in Cork. And, and the reason we have it in Cork is because one of our co-chairs is from University College Cork, has been a huge supporter of this and has a huge amount of knowledge to provide. So what we decided to do after that was pull together um, the reflections of people from that, so some of the people that presented, but because of COVID, we couldn't do it. And then what happened then because of COVID and all of you that work in services 
that knew people couldn't get out of their houses and didn't get to go to their services. Their lives were absolutely, completely discombobulated. We got to know stories from people because we were online. We had way more access to people. So so the, the book has about 80 um 50, sorry, 50 um, uh, uh, personal and professional reflections, about 50-50 in terms of staff and then people who, who either their families themselves um, or advocates who, kinda, who made kind of um, contrib- contributions to this. It's a very helpful, um, if, if any of you teach, because I know there's some CNME people here as well, so any of you that teach or any of you that, that work with people in terms of trying to get a better understanding, some of the stories are absolutely brilliant in terms of the personal story, They're, and some of them are very stark, but it was great to have it you know, at the time as well. Um, we still have, because we still have worship applications, there's a guidance to worship in terms of what are the things you must do before you start to consider a worship application. You don't pick up the phone and ring the lawyer. You exhaust a number of things. And any, any particular social workers here as well will know there's a whole load of things that you need to do first before you move to. The, and even if you've moved, you still need to go back and make sure have we done this properly before, because we will still have people in worship for a number of years until we transition completely out of it. Um, I said earlier about the national consent policy, the, the revised policy came out last year. We didn't, just because of lack of staff, we did, we did have a national launch, but there's now this year, there's going to be a big push on making sure people know about it have read it and have done the e-learning program. There's a, there's a national e-learning program on that as well. We also have a series similar to what we have for ADM. We have a series of webinars that support it, that explain it. We have a short video on it um, and we try and link the two together. Um, uh, we have a quarterly newsletter. Um, if any of you want to do an article for that quarterly newsletter, if there's a piece of work that you're doing that's of interest, please contact us. There's Burr Grogan from Mental Health Reform is driven all the way from Dublin. Good uh, timing, great to see you. Um, uh, yeah, so please get in contact with us to let us know. Um, just in terms of structures, just to see where this all sits. So this is, um, um, I can't even see it myself. So we, we sit under the Chief Strategy Officer, who is a guy called uh, Dean Sullivan. Um, we reported um, a guy called Dr. Philip Crowley. So that's where it sits in the organisation. It's at a very high level. And it's, I, like I must say, like the HSE at a national level have always supported this. See, this is an absolute priority. Obviously, there's still issues with national service plan getting signed off for 2023 but like they are taking this seriously in terms of putting resources into it to support people to do this and this is testament this is the, the investment that the hsd has done to try and make sure that there are things in place and um, there is uh, sean uh, has already talked about there's a national transitional oversight group that is a forum if there are issues in terms of practice when it commences that are not just local issues that are national issues that's the forum to, to send things so you can do that through our office and um, Sean talked about the um, the consent vaccination group the purpose of that one was to be able to deal with issues that started off locally but they affect everybody and it worked really well so we said okay let's do it for this that there's a forum that people can flag things up and um, that's really important because it could be that this small issue actually has is taken legs and we need to identify it and um, you can always come directly to our office or to Jerry or to other people that are here as well I think it's really important that people feel empowered to flag things instead of kind of feeling like this is I'm just like I'm in treacle here this is just too difficult you know so um, uh, there's also, um, a, 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 we do every two weekly and we have a Friday call just to kind of update people. So people that have been assigned the role or people that have formally taken on an ADM lead role. Um, and Jerry might say something a bit more about that in terms of CH1. And there is a CH1 um, working group. Up, there's people that are here on that as well. So you might want to say that um, later on. Um, just in terms of some upcoming events, um, on the 21st of March, we have another webinar. Um, uh, and it's really about what do you need to... So today is about the kind of higher level generality piece. The one on the 21st of March is how do you access the DSS register? When are wardship applications going to stop? And what do I need to start doing and stop doing? Um, uh, you know, uh, the, the one on the 29th then, and also some of the stuff that Sean was talking about, which is calm down, you know, on the 20... It's not... You know, you'll all remember GDPR. We all thought it was going to be a great big car crash. It wasn't because we already had huge systems in place to protect people. So it's the same with this. It's really just about reiterating that message. And if somebody spots something that's a problem, let's work through it and figure out we did it in COVID. We can do it again. You know, and I really think that people need to remember that, that we've got great resilience as, you know, as healthcare workers. Um, on the 29th of March, we're going to have a session specifically on advanced health 
child care directors because they're a little bit more technical and because it is about life and death I think it is kind of like it's raising people's ire in terms of fear about okay well what you know what is valid and applicable so we'll work through that we'll be working through this throughout the year throughout throughout next year and thereafter because it's new you know so it's not not guillotine it won't stop on the you know once once it commences um we will be um on you talked about we're, we're collaborating with the decision support service on those capacity assessments for uh, uh, co-decision making agreements and epas we're working on that at the moment information will come out um once we've that done we also will have a national mentorship program there'll be spaces available for cho1 we'll be looking for and just to put it out there we'll be looking for how many mentors from cho1 three three, three mentors who are who wish who are people that want to be able to support people around us so i've just put it out there this is the first group that we put it out to, and we'll also be looking for mentees people who would like to to be to be on that mentorship program it's like an action learning set so those of you that have been involved in action learning over the years will know it's the same kind of model works really well so and we just decided that we try and do that because people need to be able to have their cases and work through them in a safe space to be able to figure out okay what is it you know what's local and what's national so that that will commence in september but the recruitment will be starting in may so just to kind of flag that up to you um once the decision support service codes come out we will then see what the gaps are if there's any guidance that we need to do whether we need to do supplementary guidance on the functional assessment we'll see how we go we'll see what the feedback is like from people we kind of just have to wait a little bit and see how people are there's a survey of um, learning needs coming out in the next week um, which is what do you need to know what kinds of what what kind of information do you need we're very aware that people are overwhelmed um, and we also aware that people learn differently now webinars work for people this kind of forum works for people podcasts people are saying give us a podcast when I'm walking to work I can listen to it um, or when I'm you know when I'm on a like on a lunch break walking I can do half an hour and it's way quicker than doing a webinar I know some people are like I wouldn't be listening to that now but anyway um, uh, <laughs> Um, and then uh, we will be doing information on how to access the DSS, the DSS register because it's different for us because we are such a big organisation. So we're having to chunk it down to explain to people this is what it's going to look like. Um, so in terms of accessibility, you can contact us directly. Jacqueline will be talking. She'll be showing you a small video that we did um, in relation to how, what, the, what the act means for me as a person. Um, <clears throat> our website is available. If there is anything that's missing or if ye are doing stuff here um, uh, in CHO1 that you think we'd like to have that, you know, and put it up on our website, we're happy to do that. We're happy to collaborate on, you know, if there's a particular thing that you'd like to work through. I live here, so uh, hint, hint, I'm easily accessible. So, you know, and I'm happy to, more than happy to come to Sligo. I live in Donegal now, so uh, I'm happy to come to Sligo at any stage. So um, thank you for that and thank you for your time.